What a powerful time already today together. And we're talking about being together and how important it is, even in the world we're living in, even with the limitations and all the context of, you know, really uh, COVID. And so we're talking about the importance of it and the importance of getting together uh, safely and, and doing it for reasons like what we just saw on stage. That was a real conversation, wasn't it? It went beyond, and this is the title of the message, beyond the coffee and donuts or pancakes or O'Bran. And it got real, didn't it? Church, I want you to understand something that when we get together, we're going to grow together. But the thing is, is sometimes there needs to be some healing together. Something real happened in the first service. I want to just put it out there right now, just in case there's different stories and different chatter. But at the very end of our first service, when I said, have a great day, uh, one of our sisters in Christ came running down desperate for prayer, yelling, asking, I need prayer, I need prayer. So immediately she came down and we circled her as elders and as pastors and we prayed over her for deliverance and anything else she was wrestling with. And I just want you to be aware of that in case there is different conversations of what took place. That's what it was. And to be honest with you, church, I think we need to be ready for those kind of things to happen. Jesus was interrupted many times when he walked the streets of Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee because there was people desperate, desperate for deliverance, desperate for truth, desperate for healings for their children. And so even when he was walking from place to place, they would come. I appreciate that she waited till the very end. That was, that was very, very suitable and appropriate of her to do that. And I thank her for that. She was desperate for help. And so we're, we're already seeing this morning, the nine o'clock service, they all heard that, they all saw it. And, and today you're seeing this story, but you, you heard my heart during worship that you know God, God is ready to, God first of all wants to be over all things that you deal with. And the proper place for our burdens and our weight that we wrestle with, whether it's emotional, physical, spiritual, is actually at the feet of Jesus, not above where he is or over him. In other words, we don't make them more important than Jesus. We bring them to Jesus and let him help us. But here's the reality. Sometimes we need to bring them to our brothers and sisters in Christ because we need each other to help each other process through those. God has ordained that you live in fellowship. As we learned last week, we are the body of Christ, the family of God, and we live in fellowship. And sometimes when we do that, it gets real. And I want to make a note real quick, too, because sometimes our church may get the rumor that we're swinging from chandeliers. We don't have any. If we're excited about Jesus, it's because we recognize how much he's done for us. Amen. If someone wants to yell hallelujah during worship song, let's let them yell hallelujah because we don't know what they went through that week. We don't know that they may have had a financial breakthrough, a healing, their family member got saved. We don't know. It's going to get a little real. But at the same time, can we do it in decency and in order? Absolutely. God is a gentleman too. And during the first service, when it became quiet, God gave one of our brothers in Christ a word to speak in tongues. We believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is Paul, by the way, teaching this. So Paul taught as well the, the gift and the proper use of speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, but then interpretation of tongues. And God spoke to our church this morning. It was suitable. It was appropriate. It was done in decency and order, as Paul says it should be. And God said that I know that what is going on in our world is extremely heavy, but I will not forsake you. I will not leave you. Trust in me. Praise God. Praise God. I don't know about you, but coffee and food won't get you through some things you're going to deal with. You got to bring the spiritual into the physical. You got to bring the spiritual into the physical. And the spiritual gifts of 1 Corinthians 12 is what we needed this morning. 
And we prayed over our sister in Christ for over 20 minutes up here and processed with her what she's been wrestling with. And to be honest with you, I thought it was beautiful because she was being tormented by whatever was bothering her in her life. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, this is a book, and this is what we're going to use as our main text today, and I want to share something else as well in Mark 2. It's on the screen for you. It's an Old Testament book. It's not used very often, but it's a wisdom book, and it's really to the point here. There is no deeper meanings here. This, it is what it is. It says this, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. This scripture is revealing the wisdom of community the wisdom of companionship, that in it you will find growth and productivity, you will find help in time of need, care and comfort in life, and lastly, safety and security. And this wisdom holds true today that when we are actively in fellowship with other believers, we are really stronger. We are stronger together. The Bible is full of one another's, and one of the ones I want to focus on today in our short time here is Galatians 6 2. It says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. This is one of 59 one another's in the Bible talking about how we should be there for one another. This is one of the 59. It says, Carry each other's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry means to, the picture here, the Greek word being used is someone's traveling for a long time. They're carrying a load or weight. It could be anything, emotional, physical needs, and spiritual. And we come alongside them and help them carry it. Help them get through that long journey. Burdens can be anything. This past week, I helped walk through a journey. The past couple weeks, I've helped walk One of my friends, he lost his dad, and so I walked through this journey with him this past week, and yesterday we did his celebration of life service, his father's service. So sometimes it's a loss of a family member. Sometimes it's removing trees from your house. Anyone have to do that? And we need a little help. Sometimes it's fixing our roof here at church, and everyone pitched in and worked together. Thank you, and thank you for the gifts and the prayer for that. Sometimes it's coming in here, and by the way, when you volunteer on Sunday mornings and you're taking care of everything, whether it's the tech or the greeting or parking, that helps us as leaders go, awesome, like the burden is off me, I can focus on what I do. Even that little thing helps. We can carry burdens from severe to simple ones. Uh, My friend who lost his father, their neighbor said, hey, why don't we watch your kids so you can focus on the service all day. Isn't that a nice gesture? So you don't count anything out. It's helping carry one another's burdens. And and this is what Paul says, in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. And what does the law of Christ mean to Paul? It means to love God and love one another. The 10 commandments are wrapped up in those two commandments, love God and love one another. You can wrap all four of those commandments in those two. And so he's saying we fulfill what Christ said we should do when we help carry each other's burdens. Now here's the thing though, as we saw this morning at nine o'clock and as we saw at this table as an idea of what actually does take place by the way, this takes place. We start to release burdens and when we bear with each other, it's going to get real. Things are going to get heavy. And what I'm asking us as a church to do is don't be afraid of it, but to embrace it. Because when someone's truly hurting, they truly need our help. Amen? What does real fellowship look like? What does real fellowship look like? I have these, by the way, on our website, calvarydover.org. I have our, my main takeaways and notes today, calvarydover.org forward slash grow. It's our grow page. 
What does real fellowship look like? Real fellowship is where we can feel comfortable to be ourselves. Where we feel comfortable to be ourselves. We hope that when you come in here and when you're in your community groups or you're with other believers in this church, that you can feel comfortable to be who God has made you to be. Your personality, your looks, whatever it may be, to be yourself. That's not a factor for us. What's a factor is we are one in the body of Christ. And we just love you because we love you. We don't have to love you. We want to love you as a family member. Real fellowship, secondly, is where we can wrestle with questions and doubts and still be accepted. Not shunned because we have questions or doubts. Oh, no, that person's bad. They have doubts. We can't be like that. I worked with youth for 11 years in this church, and I worked with young adults for another two. There's really good questions, and they're valid. But there's also answers. And there's doubts. And Jesus and anyone in the Bible that we read about would work through those questions and doubts. In fact, Paul reasoned with those in Athens in Acts chapter 17. He was trying to help them understand Jesus Christ even when they didn't, and they didn't know who they were worshiping, and he tried to help them understand. It's okay for people to have questions and doubts, and we need to be there for them, amen? Let it be a safe place. Let real fellowship, where it can get real, be a safe place to have those questions. Now, here's what's gonna happen. When someone has real questions and doubts, guess what that makes us do? It makes us go and study and learn, right? It makes us grow. And then we have to be a really good listener. We have to not come to conclusions. See, next thing you know it, this this fellowship is sharpening you to be a better follower and better child of God. Real fellowship is where we can trust to share our burdens, our personal burdens. Now, what you saw today in this skit was a perfect example of mature people coming together in a mature group. This was a fellowship of guys who have been there for each other for a while where they feel like they can trust each other to open up. That's not going to happen in the first week. It's not going to happen in the first, well, some, some people may. Some people are so desperate they just need to process, and that's okay. But that is a mature group who has built trust over time by being committed and confidential with each other. By the way, I'm like doing group training right now, just in case you're going to lead a group or be in a group. I am not going to share things with people I don't trust. It's going to take commitment and confidentiality and a comfort that I know that I can rest assured that that person is not going to slander me with whatever I say. And so as pastors, there isn't many people we share with, just to be completely frank. And that's why suicide among pastors is rising, because they don't know who to talk to because they've been stabbed in the back or betrayed or something like that. And it hurts to see that. It hurts to see fellow pastors and your brother or your sister in Christ do that because they don't feel safe to open up. We got to do better, right, church? And that just doesn't go for church leaders. That goes for everyone. It's not just about church leaders. It's about you, too. You want to open up, but you need to feel safe like you can. And so real fellowship allows people to get real, and it's not going to be broadcasted to everyone else in their family. Real fellowship is where we can receive biblical correction with humility. Here's a reality. The Bible is meant to not just encourage you, but to correct you. The Bible is here to to cut away the sin and to carve you into the image of Jesus Christ. The Bible is a double-edged sword, the Bible says. And what it does is it cuts to the bone and marrow of your heart and it reveals and cuts away the things that don't belong so you can become the perfect image of Christ when he returns. And so we have to be humble to receive truth, not what we want to hear. But we who deliver truth must also be humble and not be conceited in what we're delivering. Like we don't have anything wrong with us. This is what real fellowship is. And lastly, real fellowship is willing to embrace real life issues so we can come out of them more like Jesus. 
We're not afraid, we're willing to embrace. This is an overall statement that I am willing to go through the mess of your life because I know the end game is to be set free and to be all that Jesus has created you to be. And so we have to be willing to embrace those messes. And sometimes it hurts and sometimes it doesn't go well, sometimes it doesn't end well. And by the way, doing life together and getting real is a risk. Because isn't it often that in relationship we are hurt? But what's amazing is in relationship we are also healed. Starting with the relationship with Jesus Christ. And then as we are healed in Jesus Christ because we recognize his love and forgiveness and acceptance for us, then when we hang out with people, they should demonstrate that same love and acceptance and forgiveness and honesty because Jesus was honest, wasn't he? When that woman was accused of living in adultery, he didn't say, it's okay, keep going. He said, where are your accusers? Now go and sin no more. He will balance himself out, and here's why. Because he is Jesus of grace and truth. He is both. And so we have to be willing to receive that with humility. We also have to be willing to give it with humility, and we must be ready to embrace real-life issues. This is a heavy message, isn't it? But you know what? The devil is a liar. And he is constantly working... We're agreeing on that, right? He is constantly working, trying to pick apart the family of God. You heard me say that uh, last week. He works full time. He doesn't stop. Thank God, God never does either. And we as a church are an army together and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Praise God. And when we get together, things shift in our hearts. When truth can come in, grace can come in. And one of the the greatest stories I love in the Bible, it's actually not even about community, but you can take a great lesson from it, a notable lesson from it. I want to go to Mark chapter 2. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. I'm going to close with this story. It's kind of what happened today. Spiritual work, spiritual deliverance today, healing. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. When Jesus heals a paralyzed man. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where, we, where, where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, notice Jesus was preaching God's word. It wasn't self-help or human philosophy, was it? It was God's word. He was probably reading the Old Testament. He's reading prophets. It says four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on the mat right down in front of Jesus, seeing their faith. Who has friends with faith in this room? Thank God for them. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Hold on a second. We brought him to be healed physically. What happened, Jesus? We were, we, he needs he, he can't walk. Well, let me keep reading. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. 
There's no doubt the point of this story is to highlight the authority and the divinity of Jesus Christ, that he is from God, he is God in the flesh. That is the point of this story. And the religious leaders thought it was blasphemy because they didn't believe that, but Jesus is who he is and he can't help it. And he's being who he's supposed to be. To prove his divinity, he did something physically because you can hide something spiritually. You know what I'm saying? In other words, they couldn't see what he did spiritually to forgive. So what he did is he healed them physically. Where I'm trying to get at here is Jesus is doing work in us spiritually, but we must be together physically as well. And we will see physical changes too. But what's important to also understand is there are things in your friend's life, your family, our church body, where they need a spiritual work done, not just a physical friend. So we need both. What they found out is that Jesus cared about it all. Not just his physical state, but also his spiritual state. What good is it? My friends, church, what good is it to have perfect legs and a perfect body, but have a soul that has not been forgiven? You're going to go to hell looking really good. Jesus cares about people so much that when he sees the real issue, he deals with it. But here's the thing. What if those four friends never brought him to Jesus? What if those four friends did not throw a mat together, throw him on that and say, we know a person who's going to deliver you and we're going to take him to you, to to you, to him. We're going to take you and it's going to be awesome. They had that kind of faith. They weren't going to stop until they ripped that roof open and they lowered him down on that mat and he was in front of Jesus at the feet of Jesus not above him, at the feet of Jesus, where we should lay our burdens and our worries right now at his feet. He's been trying to tell us this entire service, hasn't he? Who's on your mat? Because you have a responsibility, I have a responsibility to carry a mat, because we're the church. We're the body, the family of God. Who has carried your mat? Let's thank them. Amen? Like this week, I want to challenge us all, myself included, to thank those who carried us through difficult seasons. Thank God for them. Thank God that we have a family or friends or the body of Christ to help us. Even if they're not Christians and they've been there for you, acknowledge it and thank them. And then church, I want to challenge you to seek out to have your eyes open, to have faith that if I get with this person and bring them to Jesus, and that means bring the word and pray for them around that coffee table, that Jesus is going to move and do work in someone spiritually and physically. Where Jesus is, transformation is going to happen. So I'm going to close with this. Carry one another to not only the grace of Jesus, but the truth of Jesus Christ. Getting together allows us to express and experience the love of God firsthand. And when we go through things together, we grow through them together. We need to get together. And we even have a home right now. If you have a home and there's someone living in that home, We need each other in that home. If you have friends or neighbors, they need us. If you have fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, they need you. And when we get together, healing and growth can happen, especially when we bring Jesus to the center of that conversation. We didn't see that part because I'm preaching it, but that's what was next. Encouragement from the word of God, prayer, listening, No judgment, no condemnation, love, truth. Amen. Let's pray. Why don't we stand together and pray? God, 
We thank you for getting real with us. We thank you, God, that you go beyond what we can see and you deal with the heart and the soul of man. We thank you, God, for our salvation today. And if anyone does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray, God, that they would call out to you to be saved, that they would admit they need you, that they would repent of sin, they would turn away from sin, and that means to turn to you and rely on you for all they need. May we put our faith in Jesus Christ and not ourselves or this world. May that take place in hearts today so we can be changed and become a child of God. Now, Lord, thank you that because you're real with us, we can be real with each other and we can do it right. And God, when we get together, we can grow and we can heal together so we can mature and be a light in this world. And God, you even use brokenness. You use people who are not even complete and have it all together. That just, I just can't fathom that at times in my own life. God, you use broken vessels because your grace is sufficient and greater. And God, we together, as the body of Christ, can be there for one another. Help us to see burdens and weight to help carry. We thank you, God, for this challenge today. We thank you, Lord, for our place in the body of Christ. Be with us this week. And bless our sister in Christ this morning who needed prayer. Set her free, Lord. God, we thank you for Eugenie, Eugenie White, Lord, who's, who's struggling right now in the hospital. We thank you for her life, who's wrestling with cancer and other complications. We pray for a healing right now in Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus Christ and the mercy of Christ to heal her. Your power, Lord, to enter that room. And may it be a testimony, God. A testimony of your glory and your supernatural power. And Lord, we lift up Nate Warren, who lost his sister this weekend. God, strengthen the family. My friends, the Lewis family who lost their father, strengthen both families who lost their loved ones this week. We are there for them, God. Help us to be there physically as well as as we pray spiritually. God, we thank you. Comfort them during this time. Lord, we cast our burdens and our cares at your feet, the best place to put them, so we can look up to you and see your love and the victory over this world is you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Have an amazing Sunday.